Welcome to Inside OPSU. I'm Consuelo, the Director of Continuing Education at OPSU's Guyman Classroom. We're here on the main campus for the 19th annual Panhandle Area Art Jubilee. We'll be looking at the different art, we'll be watching some of the demonstrations and talking to some of the students from the area.
on one flower getting the darkest darks, but I did a little bit of everything. And that's what you want to do. You want to put down your darks everywhere, get a little bit of something happening all over the page. And plus it looks like you've accomplished something. So that always helps too. See already we're getting nice purple shadows going. I'm going to take this off so I don't get pastel everywhere. Because if you ask anybody that's already had me in pastel class, most times in the first few minutes of class, I will already have black smudge all over my face. And everybody laughs and makes fun of me, but hey. I'm just getting into my work. And I also have, I don't know if you guys noticed this, it is really dirty and gross right now, but this is a chamois and it works great as an eraser um, for your pastel. If I can take away some of the charcoal if I want. And you can wash them, let them dry, use them right again. 
and this is a little different for me working on a flat surface. Most times I'm standing up at an easel, um, working up and down. And when you do that, your the pastel dust will fall down, and it's always a good idea to put some kind of tray, like you see on that one right there, that white piece that catches all your pastel dust and makes it really easy to clean. Up. Also, I'm a pretty detailed person. That's why it takes me so long to get done with anything. It's a blessing and a curse. Um, if I got any highly realistic people in here, artists, yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Trying to get all those details just perfect. And plus, I think I have a little bit of OCD, so that doesn't help me either. And you'll notice that I chose blue instead of a black, which before I got to OPSU, I didn't really have any art classes in high school whatsoever. I had an ITV art class, and that was awful. Holding up your artwork in front of a TV, wouldn't recommend it. Um, but I always thought shadows were just black. That's all I had in my mind. When I got here, Yvonne introduced me to purples and dark blues, and it really makes your artwork pop, guys. Next time you're thinking about your shadows, try some purples and blues. And now what I'm doing is I'm taking another pastel and just kind of going over the light color that I laid down just to blend it in a little bit and make it look smoother. Because the more you go over it and blend it, the smoother and softer it will look. How many of you guys were here last year and saw me do a pastel demonstration? A few of you? I hope I'm a little less boring. I know it's kind of tough to sit there and just watch me work without much happening, but I'm trying to get a lot laid down so you guys can actually see. And I'm not pressing real hard. I'm actually letting the pastel stick do much of the work. Really push those darks, guys. Really helps the light areas stand out more. Creates a lot of contrast in your piece. And imagine how boring this would be if it was just black shadows. We're getting really good purples from mixing. Yvonne, if you have anything, you're the, this lady guys over here, she is the master. So, don't pay much attention to what I say. Listen, she is fabulous. She's my right hand. I trust her. If she's going to graduate this year and hopefully go on to be a teacher, and she will be fabulous. I've trusted her to help me with my classes and to go and workshop with me. When I retire, I hope she comes and takes my place. Not anytime too soon. And I forgot to mention there's two sides to this paper. If you guys have worked with it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm using the side I call the side with the sticker because that's how most times it is. Um, it doesn't have as big of a grain as the opposite side, and it just it helps it look smoother, I think. You have to work a little bit harder on the opposite side to get it covered. Um, so, I mean, there's no right or wrong way. You guys pick whatever side you like best, but this is my favorite side to work with. All right, Sage, you just gave your presentation to the students. Um, 
Let's start with your background. Okay. Um, I grew up in Derzette, Texas. Uh, OPSU is about an hour, 30 minutes away from there. So that was always a school that was in my sights when I started looking um, to go to college. Both my parents graduated from there. Uh, we moved around several times because my dad is a coach and mom's a teacher. And um, I loved art from like a really young age. Like kindergarten, we're talking drawing cartoon unicorns, stuff like that. Like I've, I've always loved it. But I haven't been able to take art classes. All the small schools, they didn't offer art classes. Just ITV was the only thing I had my sophomore year, so. Wow, all right, so then coming over here, you, you gave a demonstration. Tell us how you got to the point where you're actually doing demonstrations here for the Art Jubilee. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question, because um, uh, four years ago, I would have never imagined I'd be taking Yvonne's place doing pastel demonstrations. Um, I came here not knowing very much about art. I just kind of had like a natural talent, they call it. <laughs> and um, I was introduced to pastel by Yvonne, and I loved it because of the bright colors. Like you can just see kind of looking yeah, all looking these bright colors you can use with pastels. Um, painting was one of my favorite things to do and drawing, but when I was introduced to pastels, it completely changed. So uh, I guess Yvonne just picked me out, noticed I was kind of like her, because when she would walk around the room, she'd be like, oh, you remind me so much of uh, myself, Sage. And I was like, like that really meant a lot to me, because she is obviously an incredible artist, so. All right, so show us the, the picture that you were using as a reference mm -hmm. for this. Yes. And Sean, I'm not real sure if you can get this, the picture itself. Okay, this was the reference photo I was going off of, and, um, like I told the kids today, I started out kind of a bad habit. I wanted to copy my reference photo exactly, like every detail, everything. And then someone finally told me, well, what's the point in making art if you could just have a photo of it? Like, just use the photo. And I was like, that's, that's true. Um, like, why make art when there's photography? So the goal is to make your art piece better than your reference photo. Enhancing the colors, taking out things, adding things, just giving it that unique look that, I mean, you don't get with photography. Okay. Very good. Um, and then <laughs> last but not least, because I know we've got, we've got the quick draw competition about to get started. What is it about art? What is the draw for you? Oh. Uh, that was a good pun, too. That was yeah, an accident. Yeah, that was a good. I don't know. It's honestly... I love that feeling when you get lost in a piece of work. You're not worried about anybody around you. You're not worried about your daily problems, what you have to do later in the day. Like you're, it is just you and your artwork. And it's just that zone that like, I, I love it. Only artists, like we just, we have that zone and it just keeps, keeps drawing me back, keeps wanting me to push myself and do better. And I've got, you know, wonderful teachers that I look at their artwork and I just like I want to be that good like I want to do as good as they are because I look up to them so much and uh, yeah it's just I don't know it's hard to put in words honestly Well, then what does the future have in store for you what are your plans um, I'm graduating this May and I've applied to a couple graduate schools so hopefully college art teacher in the future we'll see yeah. uh, that would be like my absolute dream job I think Okay, very good, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, we have with us now Yvonne Sangster. Tell us, um, give us your official title here on campus. I'm an instructor years. of art. Okay, and yes. tell us about, because you teach pastels, what are, what are the other things that you teach? Oh, I just yes. know of pastel. pastel. Well, pastel's my passion. And in fact, pastel was not even in the curriculum until they hired me, then they put it into the curriculum. And not, not a lot of universities have actual pastel courses, but I teach uh, I teach figure drawing and fundamentals, design one and design two, and I forget it, drawing one and drawing two. So I'm quite busy. Okay, and pastel is your passion. Tell That's us about the passion. pastels. The pastels, okay. about why I'm into it, or the pastel medium itself. Um, yes, give us yes. yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, for our viewers, if they don't know the different the different, the different mediums, you know what what is a pastel, okay. and then what it is. Okay, yeah. pastel is is pure pigment. Uh, like oil has 
uh, oil paint. It has it has oil to bind it together. Acrylic has is pigment with acrylic. Watercolor is actual watercolor and pigment. Pastel takes very little binder to hold it together, and it's it's like the purest form of pigment you can get. That's why you can go to a museum and you can see pastel paintings that are hundreds of years old, uh, America Sot and a Degas, and they're just as fresh and pure as the day that they were painted. Whereas you can go to uh, a lot of museums and they've had to restore oil paints. You know, you you've always heard of them, that they're cracking and peeling, they had to restore them. Uh, pastel, I can do a pa pastel painting people get from me will be the same, look just the same 200 years from now because it's pure pigment, especially if you be careful what kind of uh, paper you put it on and it's like archival and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, if next time you go to a museum, take a close look at a, a Degas or America Sot and, uh, or any pastel that's very old and you'll see how pure and fresh they are. And they have a, there's a pigment uh, it's a pigment, but it's almost like little diamond facets, and that's why I don't spray it or don't put fixative on it, because it almost like the light reflects from the from the pigment, and it and it reflects the light. Mm -hmm. And it, and if you spray it with a fixative, it kills it. Okay, so how do you preserve your how do you preserve just your pastel? Put it under glass, just like cassot. It's like a Dago, you know, and you just put them under glass like you would have to a drawing or a watercolor that's on paper. They have to be under glass, you know, same difference. Okay. And why? Why the passion for the pastels? Oh, I tell you, I, I've been an artist. My mother was an artist, and I grew up when I was three. She would sit by me and I'd draw, you know, and she would say, I say draw a cat, she draw a cat, and then I draw a cat. So that's been my, I've always loved art. And and so I got, um, I, back when, when I first, when I first went to school, I had some teachers that were not very encouraging. And I mean, they were, but it's a, it's a long story. I could go into that. <laughs> but anyway, I got, I kind of got out of it for a while because I, I got lost my confidence a little bit. And um, because I'm more of a realist. And when I had a teacher that um, told me he wanted me to draw mother's conception and not rhinoceros milk, and I go, okay. And so I start drawing all this, you know. Well, he comes and yanks the paper out from under me, wads it up, and throws it in the trash, and tells me to start all over. So oh, wow. anyway, yeah. And I thought, okay. And I kind of got discouraged and thought maybe I wasn't talented enough. And so I got busy. I got married and raised a family. And so, so I went, my mother-in-law saw my, she just saw what I had. And, 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 um, and my mother has, 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 has been passed since, but um, she said, she got me back in my first Ben Connors classes. And she, she, from a lady and got me started. He's a world renowned uh, uh, pastelist and oil painting. I, I learned pastel and oil side by side. It rekindled that passion. And he just kind of saw what I had and he kind of took me under his wing. And so, and I, and I hit, I did oils also in pastel, but I love the immediacy. And it's like, it's like, like sculpture or clay because you're working with your hands and you're touching it. I'm not using brushes or pencils, but you're actually handling the pastels. So it's almost like you're really involved with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I could, I could, uh, I could paint you know, put it down, pick up my wipe my hands off, go take care of the kids. I didn't have to worry about cleaning brushes. You know, it was just so meaty. I didn't have to wait for anything to dry. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, that was my pet, and I just fell in love with it. And I studied under him, uh, well, in 87 was my first class, and I, he died about seven years ago, and I studied probably over 450, 400 hours under him at private. In, and so that's where I developed my love for pastel was the, the, from him and the color and taking the workshops. And, and people think pastel is, um, they think pale yellow and pink. They think, oh, pastel colors. You know how people at Easter, I'm getting a pastel color dress. They're so vibrant. They have no idea. If you see my paintings, you know. I have. You know, I, I mean, look at the, uh, the pastel palette. You get it. And I tell my students, they'll say, I'll say, where's your other box that I didn't get it out? Are you kidding? 
you get that box out so that you have these to pick from. You don't want to limit your creativity. And, and, and so I get my pastels out. I got 180 Rembrandts. So I got 100 and something sin layers. And I got 96 new pastels. And, 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 and I tell my students, this is how my fingers do the walk and I'm looking for the pink. <laughs> <laughs> the right color, you know, because it's inspiring to see all that color, and and I and, and I and I love color, and uh, in the same color theory I teach in pastel, I w I would teach when I work with them in other media's also, and and the main thing is is that we look at the the color the color wheel I learned from Ben with yellow at the top that all shadows advance toward violet and so instead of having a dull brown shadow if I have red I'm going to go to red violet to violet and shadow and if I have something that's orange I'm going to go to 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 orange to, to red orange to red if I have something that's that's green I'm going to go to blue green to blue and shadow following that color wheel and having temperature change instead of just a lighter color and a darker color but having the temperature change in my painting and give it exciting and vibrancy and I think that's why people collect my work that's why they collected Ben Connors's work he was my mentor uh, is because of the, it, the he he was inspired by the impressionists and and so and people think Oh, that looks so much like a photograph, and I'm going to say, no, it doesn't. It's just <laughs> you just think it does, and I call it impressionistic realism. Because Ben Connors coined, uh, coined that term, and I thought it's so perfect. Why is it not in the history books? And along with abstract and realism and impressionism, you got realistic and you know impressionistic realism, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 that's the way the way I like to paint and I get so involved in it and uh, just the vibrancy the colors and they're laid out and, and I think sometimes painters uh, will actually stifle their self because they'll look at it they'll think okay I'm going to paint this and they get this color out this color out this color out and, they, and they, that's what I'm going to need and they start mixing it and I get mine out, if you can see my, some of my, st and I've got this array of color before me, and I start painting, the creativity can just go. I, I'm not stifling myself by saying, there's just this color, this color, or this color. And sometimes, oh, that's it. I look at it, and, and I'll say, what color are I show? I, I don't know, let's look, and I do this. It's like it's magic fingers, but it's not, really. It's just how, I guess I, I'm just looking at it at the same time, and the students laugh. I say, but it works every time. I don't know why, but it does. Tell me about the students that, um, that take the pastel classes here on campus. Uh, I've had so many. Uh, I've got... I get students that they've never had pastel, and so they they take mine as an elective or a part of the drawing course, and uh, and they they get really. I say, okay, we're going to learn. You're going to learn about this color, and we're going to do this color theory, and and you're not going to be afraid of purple anymore. <laughs> if all else fails, you use purple. That always works. <laughs> and and they get. And I've got a, a student that. Um, that she was taking pastel and I went ahead and let her, she hadn't had her drawing yet, but she's grown so much, her name's Ricky, and, and I said, okay, let me show you how to draw. So I'm teaching her drawing at the same time, and she is loving this color, and she's loving pastel. And then Sage, that you did the interview with earlier, she first came to me, and, I, I, and if you look at a picture she did like two years ago, and, and, and it, it was so exacting. And then I taught her how to be creative. I said, I want you to be creative with color. And now she's doing really vibrant things and she's amazing. And uh, she, I trust her enough to help me with my students. I took her to a workshop that I teach every year in, in, in Mountain View, Arkansas as, as an assistant. And uh, I have students, that, and I have one student, Melanie, she said, I didn't want to take this class, and, and at first I hated it, and now she loves it. She just got, and so in, um, it's something about the blending of the colors and what have you that's, um, it's catching. 
it's very catching and and before you know it, they 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 just fall in love with it in the in the in the I just don't know how to explain it. They just do. Okay. <laughs> well, for our viewers, um, if they would like to get in touch with you, if they have any questions, comments, or concerns, how do they go about getting in touch with you? Uh, they can call me uh, in, my, in my office. Usually I'm out here if I hear the phone. Uh, my phone number is 580-349-1479. I live in Texas. Uh, just give me a call at the college. Um, come to my office. And make it, you know, and come see what we do. Uh, I have to, I'd love for you to come out to my studio and see what I do. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing this interview with Thank us. Thank you very much. 15 minutes and your time starts now. All right, we have with us now Larry Wiggins. Larry, you are the, give us your, your official title. I am a uh, visiting lecture instructor for mm -hmm. photography and art appreciation. Okay, tell us about those, those departments, uh, those classes. The uh, photography classes, we do everything from digital class, which is a beginning class, goes through all the different settings of the camera uh, to get you away from the program and auto modes and go That's into the use. white balance and uh, everything to get the different, uh, so you don't have to do so much editing in Photoshop. Uh, there is so much you can do with a camera that does away with the editing. That, uh, that's part of the digital camera. Uh, we have Photography 2, which is an advanced class of digital photography. Uh, sports photography, uh, photojournalism, commercial photography, outdoor photography, uh, macro photography, uh, studio photography. I believe we have something like eight or nine different photography classes, uh, so you can get an emphasis in that. Uh, commercial, we've actually do, uh, uh, we've done commercial shots for companies and, and stuff like that. Uh, so we, we try to get the kids into an involvement uh, with what it's really like out there, uh, like the studio doing wedding photography and portraits and, and stuff like that. So does the, does the photography department, do you, do you do things within the community as well? Uh, it all depends uh, what is going on. Uh, like I have my photographer today is going out and photographing uh, the events going on in, here on campus. One of my students is uh, actually doing a commercial shot uh, for photography class, uh, uh, advertising the uh, art jubilee today with the different schools and uh, everything is part of their assignment uh, to go uh, help show how the, to promote the school and, uh, and the art department and uh, the other departments on campus. It's just, uh, you know, it's a great place to be. So have you been have you been here at the university whenever they transitioned from film to digital? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Were you here with that whole transition? We, we have uh, actually the first class that I taught here was a film class. Uh, it's still on a book. Uh, it is getting pretty hard to come up with film and the chemical and the kids really drag their feet about wanting to buy a film camera that they will probably never use again, but mm -hmm. we still have it. Uh, but it is so much cheaper to go the digital route. Uh, when I was a photographer and using film, 
going on a trip and having an ice chest full of film and going through a thousand rolls in a month uh, got expensive. I can imagine. About a dollar a piece to, to develop them. Wow. With the, with the digital photography, what, what, has, what does that mean with the department? How has the department transitioned with that? The, the department tra has transitioned. That is what a lot of people now are wanting uh, electronic uh, portfolios. Uh, when uh, I submit stuff to magazines, there are more of them wanting to do it electronically. Uh, so you can go and, and do that with a digital camera. And uh, it's just a lot quicker, a lot simpler. You don't have to go into the developing. Uh, it might take, uh, it got to where it was taking about a week to 10 days to get film developed. Uh, I never had time to, to develop much of my own, but uh, it's just a lot quicker, a lot simpler. And uh, magazines want their stuff electronically now. Uh, either on a jump drive or a CD. Uh, most of them are wanting JPEGs. You hardly ever have anybody that requests a f print anymore. Okay. What are, um, what are the future prospects for the students that do come in through the photography department? Even if they uh, aren't interested in pursuing part of their income or their income with the photography. As an artist, they need to go out and have a camera be able to take photos for their reference photos for their paintings and their sculptures, stuff like that. When we have a student leave here, I like to think that they are ready to go out and do commercial photography, uh, work, be able to work for a magazine, start their own studio, start their own business, uh, I had several students that have done that. Maybe not as a full-time job, but as a portion of their income. Very good. Whenever we, we started off here at the Art Jubilee over in the, um, in the ballroom, mm -hmm. where they have all of the exhibits, and there were quite a few, um, there were quite a few entries of photography. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some feedback on that? You don't have to tell us who won, but just tell us about the quality of the, the students that are coming through, at least high school kids at the Jubilee. The high school students that I see coming in each year, the quality is improving. Uh, I was really, really impressed uh, with uh, the student work that I saw over there today. Uh, very, very good work. As to far as who won, I wasn't the one that judged. <laughs> I was working with a part of the, another part of the program. But uh, Well, I mean, we don't, we don't know yet. <coughs> who, who I, I think that I saw two things that uh, had been picked. One was a uh, printed on metal dog uh, that really stood out. Uh, the people that was doing the judging uh, from the computer graphics uh, department, computer department, uh, was gracious enough to step in and, and <laughs> do the judging today for that. And, uh, you know, it is so nice. Uh, we, we print on so many different things now with uh, digital photography, you print on metal, people go in and saturate and enhance the colors. Seems to be a trend right now. Print it on metal and when the light shines on it just right, it just really pops. Uh, there's the gallery wraps that we can do. We have so many more options than when it used to be, well, we have an 11 by 14. <laughs> there's a uh, print, there's so many more things that we can do now, printing on glass, printing on leather, printing on metal, uh, to get different feelings and, and reflections. And right now, it seems like there is a really big on metal print uh, with heavily saturated, vivid colors. Okay. Um, last thing before we before we go, um, tell us what what you see for the future of the photography department here on campus? I see for the future, I hope whenever I decide to retire that it uh, will continue to grow. Uh, I think the students that come, we have really good students that come. 
they are showing an interest in. It should just, they have a passion for it. And if you have a passion for it, it will work. Okay, and words of wisdom for potential viewers or potential students, they're viewers already. <laughs> <laughs> potential students. Panhandle is as good a school as you will find anywhere. I will put this art department up against any art department in the United States, anywhere, anytime, any place, I'll put our kids up against them. There you go, throw down the gauntlet. All right, thank you very much. You thank you, appreciate everything you do. So what I want you guys to do first is go ahead and tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Sherman McCon. I'm Andrew Santoro. Where are you guys from? Uh, Perryton, Texas. Perryton. All right. So uh, tell us about this. <laughs> uh, well, I think some of our viewers might know. For this whole past year, I've been, you know, with clowns, especially with Pennywise because I love him. Actually, yeah, I love the movie. Uh huh. And I thought, you know, if this is going to be my last year. I might as well go out with a bang. All right. So for our viewers, because we're, we've been walking around, you know, filming some of the different activities that are happening. This one is kind of a joint effort, so you've got, you guys have to work together on this project. Yeah. How do you decide who does what? Um, well, he was better at features like this, and I'm better at hair, so we decided to do it that way. Okay. And I'm better, and since we both got that done, we're just working together now, trying to get it finished. Okay, good, very good. What other competitions are you guys in? Um, just just, this is the only one that you're yeah. doing? Yeah. And did you bring stuff into oh, yeah, yeah, the brought, exhibit? Yeah, we yes. brought some artwork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you guys are busy. All right, what school are you guys with? Uh, Ferriton? Okay, very good. All right, good luck, guys. Thank you. Tell me your name, where you're from. Uh, Manny Medina from Hooker High School. Hold on, I'll come around. Sarah Craft, Hooker High School. <laughs> same high school. Coda Witt, Hooker High School. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to say the same name to the school. And then your name. Melissa Salgado, Hooker High School. All right, so let me come back around. Tell me how you guys came up with this plan uh, on, this, on this piece. That's Dakota. Oh dang it, I walked all the way over here. Let me come back. <laughs> it's okay. I'm gonna scoot this water back for a second. All right, so I'll just stick this over there. No, you don't have to stop, don't stop. Because you got a limited amount of time. Tell me how you came up with this, this piece. Why this? this? Piece? Well, because we all like birds and we kind of just went for something bright. All right, so how do you guys decide who does what? He's really good at outlining and we're all really good at shading, so we kind of just chose a section. But, so you have a picture to go ahead and go by. Yeah. So that's helping out a lot. How did you select that one though? She chose that one. 
<laughs> How did you select that picture? I was just looking for bright colors because they stand out really well. Okay. Are you are you kids in other competitions? Are you going to be doing anything else today, or is this it? Um, there's the quick draw. I don't know if any of them are doing it. But are you guys doing any of the other competitions? Possibly. Maybe. We're open to suggestions. <laughs> so, in in Hooker High School, because that's where all of you guys are at, is this some of the the different art projects that you guys do? Do you do chalk? Do you do pastels? What are you guys we what are you working on? We use everything from oils to chalk to charcoal. What's another one? Watercolor. Printmaking. Everything but like ceramics and pottery because we don't have like room to do it. So. Okay. Very good. All right. I'm going to get out of here because I know you guys are really working hard. <laughs> good luck with the competition, guys. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. All right, so tell me where you guys are from. What school are you with? Uh, we're with Kelton ISD in Texas. With where? Kelton ISD in Texas. Okay, your name? Uh, my name is Justin. What grade are you in? I'm a senior. Okay, and you? Uh, Trenton Jasper. Uh, I'm a junior. Okay, tell me about the... I'm pretty sure our viewers know who this is, but why did you select this piece? Uh, it was more of a time thing. We started doing Flash. And uh, it was it was too difficult, and we didn't have enough chalk, so we ended up doing Mario. It's a lot of fun. It's definitely a lot of fun. All right, so I see that you've got a sketch over there. Whose is that? That's mine. Ooh. You uh, did that, and that's what you're using as a reference. Yes, ma'am. Very good. All right. So, what's the best part about this competition so far? Other than I know you're stressed out because <laughs> of the time constraints. Uh. Really. It, all of it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, there's, no, there's not really that much stress, you get to do what you want, and th I mean, there's, there's a time limit, but uh, I'm pretty competitive, so it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to be competitive. Is this your first time to be here for yes, the Art Jubilee? Yes, ma'am, it is. Is this your first time for the Art Jubilee? Time. Okay, and how did the first one go for you? I the first one was a great experience. Is that why you're back? Yeah. <laughs> My shoes are getting all, it's good, it's good. What did you do last time you were here? Uh, I only entered uh, charcoal drawing. And, uh, so, how did you guys team up for this? Well, we're good friends, and we were like, hey, you yeah. want to do sidewalk chalk? And we were like, oh, sure. Okay, so how do you decide who's doing what part of it? He does stuff, I have to fix it. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. That's about how it works. All right, well, good luck in the competition, guys. Thank you.
simple form. Perfectly centered, slightly altered, and I love those bumps myself. My customers, some do, some don't. I live in a hippie uh, art district. Really cool. Sarah's been there. Dr. D's been there. Uh, Sitting now has been to the Paseo. Newcomers that walked in. Paseo Arts District, OKC. There's my flag. Didn't know I was supposed to leave it back home. I took it. Okay, so there's one. Ex being explained. Here's the second one. We're gonna grab the clay, center it. Open it. Compact it. Pull it. <coughs> We're getting ready for our downtown festival, the arts festival. Um, last week in April, and we have three to five thousand pots in the studio. You walk through walls of pots, stacked up in boxes everywhere, and then we're going to take them to the public. They'll they will uh, uh, decorate them. We'll put a white crackle glaze on, and they'll have three things to choose from uh, as far as paints or glazes: uh, copper, which goes all over the rainbow; blue, cobalt blue and chrome, chrome turns green, almost like this, like grass. Um, and it gets everywhere. Uh, thousands of kiddos, generations, people who grew up doing those will come through and make make them. Uh, are we doing the kiln outside? Someone watching it? You want? <laughs> okay. You gonna bump up the kiln just a tad? I'll go look at it. Okay. So all these different generations are doing it, and uh, that's what we're getting ready for. So. We're using a different clay, we're not using porcelain for that. Um, so there, whatever we can throw every seven seconds, bam, a pot, bam, 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 bam. So seven seconds, we're there from eight to five. It's a lot of pots, right? So um, once again, very simple shape. I've left the rim really thick. Can anyone guess why? He's gonna alter it, yay, thank you. Okay, so like I was saying, the ocean is coming through. Who's been on a boat before? Lake life? Any Oklahoma lake life people? Any hashtaggers? <laughs> okay, um, I live close to a bunch of lakes, so my neighbor's at the lake every chance he gets. Every weekend, he's lake life. He takes out his... Uh, whatever that thing's called, Wave Runner. Um, so I have it, you can see it's uneven. I'm gonna thin it out. I'm gonna soften those edges. And this is a technique that I love because it gives me a platform. It also gives it a dip. And I can choose that dip for where I'm gonna use it, as, whether it's a pouring vessel, uh, a mug. I'm gonna grab that and use it from there. The high point, that's where I'm gonna pull a handle from. Jeffro! So, uh, once again, mimicking the ocean, mimicking thoughts, uh, childhood memories, all these different things are coming into play. Um, who has done something based on memory? Yeah? Okay. My wife grew up going to a snow cone stand down the street from her. Guess what we do every day after work? Go get snow cones. Jonathan, what's up, buddy? This is like college reunion. I love that day. Good, good. Okay. So uh, the finish, the finish that I'm gonna have for this, I, I think backwards. Reverse engineer your works. Know what you're looking for. Have the final thought prepared, or somewhere close to it and then work your way. What steps am I gonna uh, do from get to point A to point B? If, I'm gonna, if I wanna make a vase that big and I can only make one pound, how am I gonna make that possible? Sections, coils. Make something, start it off, and add to it. That's, that'll be my next step. Kill them. I bumped it up a little bit. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, sorry. But, uh, so Does I'm gonna it have like three burners? Yes. So, does anyone like to drink jarritos? Okay, can you translate what jarritos mean? 
Little jars. Okay. Does that mimic a jarrito? Sort of. If I neck it a little more, is that better? Okay. So one thing that I'm going to do with this is I'm going to glaze it to match the top. I have the waves. I have a glaze called seafoam. Way different glaze than what that I used here. Different. It turns green to purple. Here it was just a very runny, uh, thick green glaze. Um, so the seafoam reacts differently at the studio that I'm at, and a different kiln, different chemicals. We even use different brand of min minerals. Um, so in order to get that purple back to a seafoam type green, I add a wash, a rutile wash. So instead of making washes, we have a rutile based glaze that I just water down and call it a wash. So the reaction of the two glazes will give me the mimic of the ocean. I'll leave the bottom without sea foam and it goes tan, sand, the seashore, waves, the waters. Has anyone heard the song Oceans? Yeah. Yeah. Oceans. Come on, let's see. Do you see the theme here? Alright. Cut it off, and typically, I don't leave my stuff on the back. We have over 50 students at the studio, and we do not have the luxury of space to have so many things on bats. They stack up, that's 12, 13 inches, that's a lot of space. So we have bat things, what are those called, uh, versa bats, and they are one system with an insert and then you have hundreds of these little squares like so that go into a thing like this perfect for a teaching scenario message brought to you by <laughs> um, space savers uh, and we use them because they're space savers also they go up side by side and you don't waste as much space um, they're little they're small they're versatile TV magic right here. <laughs> I have stuff that I pre-centered yesterday. Oh, look at this one. And I'm gonna open up one of these pieces. Not that one. So I thought to make life easy, I'll pre-center stuff, have it ready make it for y'all. That is way hard. So anyone that's thrown with clay, can you tell me what happens with the side effect of throwing hard clay? It's hard. It's going to wear you out. It's, huh? Sweat. So it, it's going to be like a workout. Why? Because it's hard. You're using up your muscles. You're flexing. You're out. Uh, got to be limited on the amount of pieces that you make. I work with very soft clay. Can anyone tell me why? It's a lot easier to work with. Softer, molds faster, less energy. So with this, Not only that, but the elements, you see those uh, air thingies, what are those called? Bents? They're blowing out this way. Guess what happened to the clay that's facing this side? Drying out. It's harder. Notice that one side's taller than the other. Alright, so this one is not the same way. So it's a different technique from centering one pound of clay to centering multiple pounds of clay. It's like styling hair. You don't do the same thing to short hair that you do to long hair. You don't treat curly hair the same way you treat straight hair, right? Girls? Is that I go with you? Yeah. Alright. 
Do you brush or comb curly people, curly hairs, curly people's hair? <laughs> now, my wife's got curly hair. She said, you can't run your fingers through it. I couldn't believe it. I tried to put my hand and it was like, eh, no. It's like dreadlocks. Okay, so I have this. These pieces that I made yesterday. And can anyone tell me what these things are? Caliper. Out loud, calipers? What do they do? <laughs> they measure, thank you. So uh, we use these in sculpting. Well, sculpt faces, so we got to measure. Measure point A to point B. It looks kind of weird if you put a ruler in someone's face. So this, you can measure that and then measure the space. Uh, I'm going to measure what this is. And this we use for lids. This, I can measure the inside of something, like this. And whenever I make the lid, the lid will be upside down. The lid has to fit between this so that it can go in there, right? So my top area is gonna have to be that big, and then I'm gonna form a V to go on top of it, and it will go directly on, and I'll pull it. Like I said, I made these yesterday.
professionals is just a simple simple pressure um, most people want to just color it in like they've done since grade school and that's pretty and I've seen some lovely artwork that's done with light pressure but that's just beginning color pencil there's so much more you can do more, most people will use this increased heavy pressure and you can't do it fast because if you put a heavy layer of wax down on your paper then if you want to mix another color with it, which we do, um, you can't get it to mix because it's already too globby. You've got too much goop on your paper. So you have to gradually build up the heavy pressure. Then you start getting these gorgeous jewel tones and pretty, pretty rich colors. So heavy pressure is my thing. With this, color pencils are transparent. They're, they're really more like watercolor than they are like acrylic. So when you lay a color down, the next color will show through. So those layers will work. And uh, so if you lay something down and you lay down streaks and lines and then you mix another color with it, you cover those streaks and lines and they're gonna show through. So if you didn't want that, you're cooked. They're there. Uh, because you see through each of these layers, even heavy, heavy, you're gonna be able to see one to the next. So that layering is the trick on getting this paint approach. It looks like an oil painting when you're done. And, but it takes hours to do because you're using the tip of a pencil or the side of a pencil and you're uh, putting layer on layer on layer. So there's not just orange. There's orange mixed with yellow and there's red and there's violet and all those colors are combined together. With this cat picture on this cat here to your right, I have all these colors at use. So, and they all kind of shine through different ways. So, most people who get into this and want a realistic looking picture, which a lot of us, I think, strive for photorealism, particularly when you're starting out as a student artist. And to get that effect, you have lots and lots of color that you use. This is how it kind of progresses. You start off with your underpainting, just like you're painting with acrylics or other things, and uh, gradually build up what is your local color, or the actual color of the object, and layer after layer, and then those layers show through, and you get to see, and that's how you get that rich look, that it looks like a real pro, and not that it's just a, a map you did in class. This is the burnishing thing, and, and with the Vaseline and the baby oil, or the marker, whichever, tool you prefer or even your eraser will do this you can take a cheap pink pearl eraser and you can use it to blend those marks so if you've got a big area you don't necessarily have to lay down a lot of pencil but you can 
blend them together and burnish it. Um, and that's, it's a great tool. I know that I've done some pretty good sized pieces and use some of the Vaseline because I didn't ever really, never really done that. And so I tried it out on a larger piece and let it set for about a week. And I was surprised when I came back, it wasn't greasy to touch it. The paper had somehow absorbed that. And so it was, it was slick, but it worked and it didn't leave grease spots. So applying it like this, in this case, they've just got a little Vaseline on a paintbrush and they've gone back on top of it and you can burnish it in. And um, the cool thing about this too, you can do this on lots of different surfaces. Uh, one of the, the big round sun is on canvas. You can, of course, do all kinds of papers. Uh, Yvonne said she's been working on uh, sandpaper with colored pencil, which I'm thinking that would use them up quick, but she loved it. And fabrics, all kinds of things. So whatever you use to burnish, you want to make sure it's going to last okay with whatever surface you're working on. Uh, here's the difference between just unburnished and burnished. And you can see how much of a paint effect you've got. And you can do this with heavy pressure and lots of layers. You don't have to have the blending pencil. You don't have to have the Vaseline. It'll do it itself uh, with lots and lots of layers. What's often a trick with these two is they will incorporate a white pen. I almost cried about six months ago when someone told me this factory had closed down. But Uniball makes these white opaque pens. I love them. And pictures like this have used that white pen to get some of those sharp white edges. Uh, really, really, and the, the factory is not too close to But I was at a store and they said, and I bought like 20 of them because they said, they're going out of business. So they knew a sucker that when they walked in the door, going, oh, tell them they're going out of business. She'll buy every one of them. Yes, I did. Um, this is a, something too. I was at an art show in California about three years ago and met Esther. Her name is Esther Roy, and she has invented this drawing board called the Icarus. Have any of you seen or heard of this? Every time I think about it, I want one. I think, oh, I'll get one for my classroom, but there'll only be one. I need to have 20. They're about $300. Uh, but it's a heated surface that part of it's warm and part of it's cool. And she does these amazing color pencil pieces that she works on this hot, surface and it's not so hot it burns your hand it just warms up the paper and so the pencil just becomes liquid like what not liquid but softer as you're using it um, now I try if you break a pencil by, by tapping or dropping it your leg keeps falling out you actually can set that pencil in the Sun like on the dash of your car or your window and let it heat up by the Sun and it'll kind of weld it back together because of it being so waxy. Um, and I got the broad idea, okay, let's try it in the microwave. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, there was little pencil parts everywhere. And then I tried it on a, on a hot plate, like a warmer thing that I keep when we do printmaking, and all the innards of the pencil just oozed out. I just had a completely empty pencil. This is not that warm, but one side of it is just cool as can be. It, it, it isn't chilled. I mean, it's room temperature. And the other side has a heat element on it. And it's not so hot, but once you keep your hand on it and work, and then you can move from side to side or turn the heat off. She has a drawing board that lays flat, and then she has just the very same thing called a painting board that is designed to be vertical like an easel. And it's the coolest thing, and her work is amazing. But these are, like I said, about $300. Uh, I think it would be a cool toy to have, and if you're interested, it's Icarus art. Or you can just think of Icarus, he was the mythology character that put on wings and tried to fly too close to the sun. So I think it's a great tool to look at, and she's wonderful to work with. This is what I'm talking about, the waxy bloom. You're working with incredibly greasy tools. And if they sit for a month, maybe six months, certainly in that amount of time, you're gonna notice them getting cloudy. And they actually, the wax in the pencil will bubble up, not bubble, but it'll rise to the surface and your picture will look like it's dusty or it's just got a little milky film on it. 
and the heavy when people start working with heavier pressure and richer and more layers you have this happen you can take a soft cloth and you can wipe it off but who wants to go around and do that with your pictures all day and particularly if you make a picture and you give it to somebody else make an appointment every six months I'm going to come clean your picture um, so most of us varnish our colored pencil pieces when we're done so if you've got a really nice piece and you want to frame it spray it with varnish just cheap Walmart Krylon varnish before you frame it or you will that wax bloom is going to happen the fabric castell people say they don't have that problem because they're oil pencils but um, I haven't tried that out yet so I'm not sure but it does it does happen and it can happen just in a, a few weeks it certainly will happen in about six months and you, you're shocked to see what it does when you wash it off and you can just rub it off but for permanence you want to spray so anything that I finish I I wipe it off because sometimes these pieces take months to make or I put them away and don't get them out for another couple of years and <clears throat> okay so you spray it with varnish no does it go under glass yeah, yeah and then put it under glass I usually put if it's on paper I usually put paper under glass now this this guy I varnished him and I varnished him first with matte so he wasn't shiny and took some pictures and stuff and then I finished him and I wanted him shiny so I did spray varnish on him and it also keeps him from scratching so much now he's been thrown around a lot so he's got a few scratches but um, that varnish and then also just makes them real sparkly but for something under glass I just use matte varnish um, but it does this picture of my father-in-law that I did the background can't sit from where you are it does it looks like it's dusty and it's that wax bloom that started coming up on it so that's the curse of doing thicker heavier pencil is that's going to happen as far as your surfaces I talked about that a little bit I love working on colored papers um, that's my preference and then I love the black papers but just regular Canson pastel paper works great I also like working with paper that has a tone to it already um, you can do beautiful color pencil work with one color color paper black and white you don't have to have a whole bunch of them uh, the picture on the left there is you know there's black there's white there's one color, I think it's Tuscan red, and that's the picture. So much like pastels, different pressure, different points. And the other picture, you're letting the, that weird yellow green, baby pea green paper show through and uh, help create the part of the values and part of the color scheme. When I paint anymore, I like to paint it white canvas, some color before I even start. I, I have a hard time now working on white I like to start on color um, and as I said I love the black and any of the artist grade pencils will really shine on black dark papers your student grade pencils will not they just don't they aren't rich enough in color uh, the girl at the bottom is an artist I've met in Oregon she does all these fabulous animal pictures and she starts them with an acrylic painting she does kind of all the, the background color and stuff with just flat acrylic and then she takes her colored pencils and goes in and does the hair and the whiskers and the highlights and things and all the little textures with the little point of a pencil they marry together very very nicely and uh, her work is is really fun all these kind of little animals these are the little round desk I call them sunspots that I got into and I as I said I found these round canvases so I also found black gesso and I went okay let's play and uh, did all these with colored pencil and those were with the studio pencils from Derwin. Talk to you a little bit about watercolor pencils and uh, the ink watercolor pencil ink tints and there's the ink tints the pencils and the blocks this was a new discovery for me last fall and I'm so glad I found them uh, there's lots of other tools that come with them that you can get it says on the far left great and shake it actually comes with what looks like a little salt shaker that has a grater on top and so you can grate these down and and just mix a little water in them and you've got liquid watercolor 
that are just as rich as Doc Martens and some of those other expensive brands. So this is a fun thing to check out. I would recommend that you uh, you play with those if you can. Um, and boy, what a great time to be alive because thanks to Instagram and Tumblr and um, Facebook, there are all these color pencil groups that are out there. Just put the hashtag color pencil in on any social media and you'll link immediately with people all over the world that are doing this. Uh, the picture on the left is kind of a typical way a lot of people post their colored pencil work. And they will lay out the pencils that they used on their piece kind of around the perimeter of whatever their picture is. Now, I kind of think sometimes, okay, did they lie? Did they lie this other stuff? Uh, and Color Pencil Magazine is fabulous. It's an online version of it. You don't have to get the paper copy. You can subscribe to it and have it delivered on your computer or tablet. And they have wonderful contests constantly for student artists, professional artists. They're, they're seeking, they want to fill their publications. So they want uh, submissions uh, from any age group to help fill that magazine. And there's always people that are experimenting and coming up with unusual things. I like to point out too that there's not one way of doing this. You don't have to do the totally realistic looking creamy blended approach. They're beautiful pieces that you see the strokes and you see the graininess. Uh, that's a matter of personal choice. There's not one's not better than the other. And I think like a, this leaf, to see it kind of like a pastel, where you see the marks and the strokes, that can be a beautiful technique. So don't think that you just have to do colored pencils one way. You don't have to do any of this one way. Uh, so both approaches, and there may be multiple approaches out there, are great. And I find that a lot of professional illustrators who use watercolor also use colored pencils. In my experience over the last few years traveling the country with art shows and different galleries, I can tell you that art anymore is mixed media. All right, you ready, little Larry? You got the timer? Five, four, three, two.
All right. Right next to the camera. Yeah, that's good. All right. You ready? Okay, so this is what's going to happen. I'm going to take the glowing red hot pots out of the kiln, three foot tongs into the trash cans. Trash can is a chamber filled with combustible material. It's a trash can filled with newspaper, nothing fancy. Uh, reduction chamber. It's going to reduce the amount of oxygen in that atmosphere. A lot of oxygen around us in the trash can. The paper is going to burn. The pots are going to heat up the paper. It's going to burn. A lot of carbon is going to be in there and it's going to reverse the copper. Have you ever seen a copper penny? A uh, copper roof? Starts out nice and shiny, pretty. What happens after a couple months, a year? Turns green. It oxidizes. We're going to reduce the oxygen. We're going to take it back to copper. Um, if you take your sweet time and you don't, it goes and maintains green. Still flashes of copper here and there. I like it. Variation. Um, this was slightly overfired. I was blabbing too, too much in there, talking too much, and got some pretty good results. Golds and magentas and other things that typically don't get. So it's a good blessing. You ready? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to need you over there if you want to do the. Yeah. If you want to do those two, I'll do this one. Tongs. Quick sign lesson, what does it take to make fire? Oxygen. One, fuel. fuel. Okay, so we have oxygen. We had our paper that was our fuel. What's miss what was missing? Heat. Was someone here before that? Okay, all right. So three things to make fire, that's what's happening. You'll see the nice thick smoke. How many of you guys have been watching the, the fires here, the grass fires? Okay, what kind of smoke did you see? Thick smoke, green smoke, or the white smoke. You'll see that it's a thick green smoke. The moment I open up those buckets, they're going to be searching for oxygen. Has anyone seen that 80s movie, Backdraft? No, Val Kilmer, I think. Get firefighter, he opens a door, introduces oxygen into that room, and poof, kills him. Okay, same thing that's going to happen here. I'm going to burp him. I'm, going to, I'm not going to die. I'm going to open it up. Oxygen's gonna reach into it. Should have a cool explosion. This is best at night, because you'll see the little mushroom effect. Right now, you're just gonna get smoke in my face. Does anyone listen to NPR? No? Native talk. Like that. <laughs> so, um, with that, combustible materials, I'm very picky. I like black and white only. Um, use what you got, use your resources. This had colored print paper on there. Uh, the inks will burn, they'll release fumes, they'll have different exhaust coming out. Um, not necessarily healthy. Uh, people use straw, hay, uh, pine needles, they produce a heavier, thick smoke. Um, sawdust, so people have their choice of um, reduction uh, material. We like newspaper because it burns quick, it burns easy, and we have a couple of places that collect them for us. We're simply recycling it. Thanks, Frank. Okay, so that's <laughs> uh, one time recycling. So that's what's going to happen. As they're doing there, they're... Um, they're slowly cooling. They went from 1800 degrees to probably at 800 now, 700. They're crash cooling. Um, there's a rule that you shouldn't go faster than 300 degrees per blah, 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 uh, because it can crack. 
we use a specific clay that is very good with, has a very good, um, three words, has a very good coefficient thermal expansion. I can never think of those three words. That's why she's married to me. She knows it. Um, so what that means is it can expand and contract. It can take that heat. It's got a lot of sand. It's got a lot of grit to it. It can air out that way. Uh, the tighter clay bodies, like what I'm working inside, not so much. It can crack. It can split uh, simply by turning on the gas or by opening the kiln. You'll see that there's cracks on the surface. Part of it, it's decorational. You cannot drink from this. You cannot use it. Not the traditional Japanese. This is Americanized. It's a bit different. We use kilns. We use gas kilns. That's not what they used. We use reduction chambers. That's not what they used. They used it to be functional. It used to be a quick firing. Uh, they would stop in the middle of war and they would go on with their tea ceremonies. That's how Raku came about. It was a uh, traditional thing. Stop the middle of war. Let's have some tea. <laughs> Can you say that right now? No? No. All right, so I'm going to take these out. Going to get a little more smoke. Going to plunge them into the water. Now, at this point, they can crack. If so, once again, don't get attached. Make another one. Smoking. So you can see the steam coming out of it still. Woohoo! So that one, um, it was the only one in that bucket. It reduced more. It had a lot more carbon. It did turn more of a uh, copper penny, more of a copper finish. This is hot. No touchy touchy. Ooh. So you have to blunge them in at a 45. Let the water go into it because if I go in and directly plunge it, water will get inside, steam will happen, and it'll poof, blow at the bottom. That was my first time firing the kiln by myself with student work. Had a friend, Callie, Danielle, she was from California, and she said, cool, let's fire some stuff. I fired her pieces, I blew them all up. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> So you gotta aim it, um, you gotta be careful with it. Sam? All right guys, what's our time like? 203, huh? 10 minutes. Um, any questions, Q&A? What type of uh, technique did uh, the Japanese people use for their kilns? Um, it varies from region to region. It varies from um, each country has their own thing. Each region is going to have their own thing. Um, one of the main ones, the bigger, bigger known, better known, is anagama, and it simply means climbing. Yeah, climbing kiln, anagama. They'll have it, and the whole town will come together. Or if it's a region of potters, they'll all come together. Um, and it goes up the hill and it's a climbing technique. You start with your firebox at one point and the flames go up to the next chamber and up to the next chamber and up to the next chamber. They're all about utilizing the resources. Um, so a couple of guys um, a few decades ago started doing that on the East Coast and they started building anagamas. Now they have miniature anagamas, miniature climbing kilns. There's even a backpack one <laughs> that some, uh, some dude thought, hey, this would be cool to just carry, find local clays, and fire them on the spot. So 
the Anagama is the most famous one. Uh, it can take days to fire. Uh, I got a friend up in uh, Missouri. He said, anytime you're, up in, anytime you're up here and you can spend a month with me, we'll fire up the Anagama, we'll invite a few friends, we'll have a party, cookouts, uh, but be ready to stay up all night and be ready to throw logs into the fire every three minutes. So that's, that's one type. Um, the style that we use mostly in the States are downdraft reduction um, for, potter, for potters who get picky. Um, for most schools, you're going to have an electric kiln. I hear Alva has a downdraft kiln and someone else, Laverne. Laverne, do they have a downdraft kiln? Yes. Yeah. And an Fancy. Tip my hat to you. David Elder built it, I think. Woohoo! He's in the back. So downdraft kiln, all that means is the, the kiln is going to have a, a chamber, the, the box. You're going to load it up with pots. You're going to have flames coming in either from the side with forced air or from the bottom with natural draft. It's going to go up. It's going to arch down, go through the pots, affect everything, go through the very bottom, you should, typically between the burners, and go out. What that creates, it creates uh, a reduction of uh, oxygen, hence downdraft reduction, and you get beautiful reds. Did anyone see the vases that I had in there? Copper red vases? That's how that was achieved. Downdraft kiln. Killer. It goes down in nine hours. Uh, it's 100 cubic feet. You can walk into it, stretch my arms out, go up. Um, I think we have 20 plus shelves that are two by two. They stack. They're paper thin. Advancers. Uh, they reflect heat. Instead of bricks, soft or hard, we have fiber. Reflects heat. So that's how we can get 100, feet, 100 cubic feet up from room temperature to 2400 degrees within nine hours. Can I answer the question? Yeah. So in, in other regions, you're going to have your typical wood fire. Um, like uh, we had a couple people come from Mexico and they literally built a small pit fire, a small wood fire. And they got to about, I want to say seven, 800 degrees, right about a thousand, very brittle, decorational only. Uh, we had, uh, Bricks here, built the fire, put a lid on it. Once the fire burned out, uh, the pieces were done. Let them cool, pick them up. Um, this will get to maturing the clay. Um, not this kind, <laughs> the, the uh, cone 10 stuff, cone 6, cone 10. Even lower temperatures. As long as your clay is matured and your glaze is sealed, you're good, food safe. This stuff, porous, not food safe. You can. I've tried putting sealers inside. Uh, eventually, the sealer will wear out or something will happen to it. Um, what I typically do with these is I'll put a glass, a small glass, put it in there, mason jar, if I want to do flowers or things alike. Most of the time, I'll put dried, dried things in there, feathers, uh, just decorational. How do you price your bases? Um, there's, you can, you can multiply, what is, what's the retail rule? Price of cost times, what's that, three? Seven thousand dollars. <laughs> so there, there's, there's guidance as to pricing. Painters will, paint, uh, will charge by the square inch. Um, so with this, uh, I could take into consideration the, the price of uh, propane. I use propane. It cost me a hundred bucks to fill up the tank. Uh, probably more now, they keep going up every time I blink. Um, I could price to offset my kiln. I could price to offset the glaze, the, the minerals, the clay. At some point, I'll consider my time. Usually it's volunteer and price the rest. But it's, it's kind of a, you find a balance. Well, like I meant, like you said, that one, you didn't really care for the way it turned out. Yeah. How do you grade on which one you think is the prettiest raccoon um, rather than... Oh, the prettiest? That, that's just preference to me. Um, I have certain things that I'm looking for. I was telling uh, the earlier group, try to reverse things. Go for the finished look, imagine what you want, and then go work backwards. What is it going to take for me to get copper? Um, if I want copper, I'm going to have to reduce it, right? On its own, a bunch more paper. Don't burp it, don't open the lid. Otherwise, you'll get variations. Um, if I want 
a, um, if I want a copper red vase, three feet tall, I'm gonna have to work with a white stoneware um, because my uh, dark stoneware doesn't work well with the red that I use. Um, or porcelain slip it and then apply the red. So different, different things. A changes B, B changes C, C will mess you up. So uh, each thing has a, has a different effect. It's kind of like a real snowball effect. Anyone else? What kind of other combustible materials have you used? Matt? You missed that part. Yeah, uh, sawdust. You can use sawdust, uh, very fine. Uh, you need very little. You can use pine needles. You can use uh, leaves, corn husks, any organic material that will burn and create carbon. Is there a lot of variation? Some. The thicker the smoke, the muddier the colors get, or the heavier the reduction. So if I want a clean look with not much smudging and cleanup, I'll use very little. I'll use a stack of paper, set it on there, whatever burns, burns, and then I shut it off. Is it getting time to award ceremony? All right, let's go find a seat, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. If you're ever in the Paseo, come see me. 3117, 3017. That about wraps it up for this episode of Inside OPSU. We had a great time here at the 19th Annual Art Jubilee. Um, for PTCI Channel 2 and Inside OPSU, I'm Consuelo, and I'll see you on campus. Mm -hmm.